Welcome to this presentation on dealing with kissing spines. My name's Ian Bitstrup. I'm a veterinarian from Spinal Vet, Sugarloaf Creek, Victoria. Kissing spines, otherwise known as overriding dorsal spinous processes, are a really important problem of horses, but there's a lot of misunderstanding about it. So we want to help to help you to understand things better and by taking a quick but fairly deep dive into what kissing spines are about and how to deal with them. This is a really common problem of horses on post-mortem studies. There are around 90% of horses are affected by kissing spines. And in my practice, about 50 to 60% of my patients show evidence of pain associated with kissing spines. One thing that's very important to understand is it's a highly treatable disease. And contrary to a lot of the misinformation you'll find in, on the internet, it does not necessarily, or most of the time, does not require retirement of a horse or that the horse has surgery. We'll talk more about that as we go along. So the area we're talking about is this tip of the vertebrae up here. And if we look at a spine, look at more of a whole thoracic spine, we're looking at the tips of the vertebrae and particularly in this area here that, that corresponds to the saddle seat area or the, the area under the saddle seat of the horse. And it's a big problem uh, in horses when horses haven't got good posture in particular. So what's the situation when spines aren't kissing? Well, spines shouldn't be kissing if a horse has got good lifted back posture. And there should be about a five to seven millimeter gap between the vertebrae. When their spines are kissing, which is a common case with, with horses dropping them back, the tips of the vertebrae rub together and cause some irritation. And this irritation in, results in pain and inflammation in a number of the cases. Not all, as I said, 90% on postmortem. That uh, most of the studies, not just my, my experience, uh, suggest that there's about 50% that that actually have pain associated with kissing spines. The most common locations of kissing spines that that we run into in practice are under the saddle seat areas I mentioned, uh, just in this area of the thorax, and this is very much associated with drop back or sway back posture, which we'll talk about more shortly. Sad thing is that this is a very common shape for horses that you'll see, and it's often considered a very normal shape, but we'll discuss why that's not such a good thing. At the base of the wither, we also have kissing spine issues as the vertebrae are pushed together or crowded together and that often results in bulging the muscle in this area here. Uh, it certainly involves greater sensitivity of the, the muscle and it results in uh, horses being more affected by saddles in that region if they, the saddles grip that lower wither area because if they bulge under the saddle, then they increase the amount of pressure that the saddle exerts on them in a focal way. So what happens when vertebrae come together and rub each other? They, you, know, you could say there's lots of joints where um, bones are together and that's not a problem. Well, most of the time it's not a, in the early stages, it's not much of a problem. There's a little bit of inflammation, a little bit of pain, and the bone reacts by hardening at its edges. So we'll see that on x-ray later on. The next thing is the production of new bone that uh, comes around the tips of the vertebrae and is a response to inflammation of that area. And that can build up quite considerably before what is seen in a small percentage of cases where we get false joints created. And these ones are joints that the body creates to try and cope with the fact that there's bone against bone all the time. 
Very rarely do we find fusion of the tips of the vertebrae involved with kissing spines. So when they rub together, they create some inflammation and that can be also irritating nerves and creating pain. And that intensity in kissing spines can vary from non-existent to very mild, right through to extremely sore. So kissing spines is actually not just about the tips of the vertebrae rubbing together. There are three main things happening. One is that we've got rubbing of the spines. The second one is that we're, even in this area here, we've got strain of ligaments. And thirdly, down in between the vertebrae, we have strain of ligaments as well. So we'll discuss that a little bit further. So the ligament across the top of the vertebrae is called the supraspinous ligament. It's an extension of the nuchal ligament. Sorry? Uh, extension. <laughs> this is playing with me now. Uh, extension of the nuchal ligament. So the nuchal ligament travels down from the pole and finishes uh, the, with, or continues the supraspinous ligament and continues down to the to just in front of the pelvis uh, where it has a break, if you like. Now, now, it's a very important ligament. It's very useful biomechanically to the horse and also to us riders. When a horse uh, first does a bit of exercise under saddle and is doing long and low, it's actually using this ligament to actually lift up its back to a degree. So it's compensating for not using its muscles of its core to lift up its back. It's using the gravity involved with a 60 or more kilo head and neck that, that is pulling as a lever on this ligament. And sadly, it's also used when the terrible practice of roll curve is, is used and that's how they get some advantage out of that. But any high level athlete should never need roll curve to lift its back. It should have strong core strength and should not be reliant on roll curve and it should be a, a band practice as it is in most places. So the supraspinous ligament is not just a strap, it actually connects with the interspinous ligaments onto the vertebrae. So changes in vertebral orientation actually affects this as well. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So in between the vertebrae are the interspinous ligaments. And these are very important stabilizers of the spine. And if the vertebrae change in orientation, so if they go from being sort of parallel to each other to coming together at the tips, you can see what's happening at the bottom of the vertebrae. If my hands are the bodies of the vertebrae and the fingers are the tips of the vertebrae. When they come apart, the ligaments down the bottom are getting stretched and strained. And what you can see here in this picture is a spine where there is bone damage uh, or bone changes in the ligaments occurring where the, the actual ligament is being turned into bone because of the inflammation in that ligament. And this is probably the most painful part of kissing spines, more painful than the tip of the vertebrae. Um, it's in our textbooks, but many vets of my veterinary colleagues don't really seem to realize that. The, other th the third thing is that joints get jammed up. This is, this is a vertebral joint. They're all along the, the side of the spine, one on each side of a vertebral coupling. This is a fairly normal sort of joint. When it gets strained and arthritic, it develops a, a fairly ugly character. We can see a series of arthritic vertebral joints here. And that's what, what can happen when vertebrae aren't moving properly. So you imagine if those vertebrae are coming together, it's actually straining the joints down below. Uh, it's jamming them into a stiff position and lack of movement, as we know, for our own health is really bad for a joint as well. So we need to consider that as part of the problem too. So 
how do we recognize kissing spines? There are a number of symptoms that can readily be picked up by an owner, uh, and certainly ones that, that are used by veterinarians to identify uh, early on. The things that you'll start noticing early when a horse is developing kissing spines are problems that are actually can be caused by a number of sources of pain in the horse's back from saddles to birth trauma to all sorts of things. But this is, this is one of the, the sources. And what we see is a tendency for the horse to start to tighten and tense its back when it's ridden in particular. And you lose that flexibility in side bending quite often when they're, they're really feeling it. As the pain gets worse, they get stiffer and stiffer through the back. And when you're mounting the horse, the horse may drop under you uh, in a cold back sort of fashion. And many horses are warm out of that as they um, brace their back and, and accommodate to the pain. Uh, but it doesn't mean that the problem has gone away. It's just that they're more comfortable with it. The pain sadly can progressively get worse to a point where the horse starts getting nervous even at the side of the saddle. And as I said, this could be from a number of reasons, but kissing spines is one of them. In a case where the horse is getting really sore, if the horse's back is suddenly jarred by the horse tripping or some other reason, or by a rider being thrown onto the rear of the saddle seat, then it can really hurt this kissing spine area and send the horse into a fit of bucking or pig rooting. This video will hopefully help you recognize a horse that hasn't got trouble with kissing spines. So this is a horse's reaction that should, should be happening if uh, a horse isn't sore with kissing spines. When you run your fingers along the side of the spine, it should feel soft. It shouldn't be bracing uh, and it shouldn't be reactive. It shouldn't stiffen up as you run your fingers along. Uh, you've got to go along here where the multifidus muscles are and you've also got to go along the midline uh, with a bit more pressure in and going into each depression putting a little bit of pressure to see whether there's any soreness there but this is the sort of reactivity you should get on a normal horse and this is a horse with kissing spines that are, is quite uncomfortable you go to the base of the wither where it's marked here with yellow he is showing tenderness in the interspinous spaces in between the dorsal spinous processes or tips of the vertebrae is quite tender and that's reflection of strain between the vertebrae of the intervertebral ligaments particularly and reflected in the multifidus muscles of the vertebrae and if we go down further down into his back he's got tenderness of the interspinous spaces under the saddle seat and he's bracing these he'll drop his back down if we put pressure here this is all referred soreness coming out into the side of the back and when we treat these with a neural prolotherapy solution all all this tenderness should uh, go away again uh, and after a few treatments should be really um, should be not really evident. The other thing is to put pressure along beside the vertebrae uh, and if it's tightening like this you can see how the muscle itself is tensing up or I can feel it going hard under my fingers. If it's doing that and it's in an indication of back pain under the saddle seat uh, and this is uh, an indication of strain and and bony interference involved with kissing spines. It's very treatable. Do not put a horse down because of this or even retire it. It can be very well treated in the majority of horses. Likewise, if you get it at the base of the spine here, it will, uh, you get the strain occurring. It'll often cause spasm in this area here and they get quite bulky here. If you're seeing horse getting bulky in this area, it's got strain in that area because of bad posture and needs treatment. 
So as you see, it's not difficult to actually identify pain in that area. You, you, hopefully you noticed the horse was licking and chewing. He wasn't upset by the pain at all, but he was flinching and dropping his back. And that wasn't so obvious quite a bit of the time, uh, but it was apparent at some, some stages. Certainly under my hands, he was, he was dropping away even with that little bit of pressure. Really important to just start slowly and gently before you do too much. Uh, and as far as going further into looking whether it's tender or not. So don't uh, overdo it and upset the horse, but start gently and work, work a little bit heavier and hopefully you'll be able to find out for yourself what's going on. Now the veterinary diagnosis of kissing spines is a little bit more elaborate. It re palpation is a really important issue uh, or important key finding or the findings from palpation are really important. And if there are, are positive changes evident with palpation, then quite often in a veterinary setting, local anaesthetic will be injected around the kissing spines. And this is considered the gold standard test, much more gold standard than scintigraphy, ultrasound, x-rays, this is the gold standard test. And sometimes it's forgotten by my veterinary colleagues. It's something I do with every case to confirm that we've got a cause or, or a source of pain associated with this area that's not just response to palpation. On x-ray, this is the most common other test that's used and it can't be relied on because you can get horses that are got changes on x-ray that aren't suffering any pain or trouble. So this is uh, not, a, not an advanced case by any means. This is a common finding though where you get thickening of the bone. This is called sclerosis of the bone and that changes what we see on x-rays as well as the, the closeness of the vertebrae. And you can see this change at the tip of the vertebrae. This is a disrupted ligament attachment no doubt, uh, to cause that. So x-rays are useful. They're not the gold standard, though, like the local anaesthetic is. There's issues with local anaesthetic, but that is too involved for us to talk about today. Bone scans and or nuclear scintigraphy is another test that, that is used. It's expensive uh, and, and not easy to do. So it uh, is something that not everyone will be considering and it's something that I don't really think is necessary very often. This, this scan from Ross and Dyson's textbook shows changes here. These black areas are where radioactive material is coming out of the inflamed parts of the bone and lighting up the camera. And so we've got indications of trouble here. I don't know whether you can see enough there. This is the tips of the vertebrae. This is actually below the tips of the vertebrae around where the interspinous ligaments are. So it's actually not the tips of the vertebrae that are showing the inflammation in that case. What are the causes of kissing spines? Now kissing spines are a complex issue as we talked about. Number one cause is that of postural problems and as I mentioned, this shape horse, which is, this is, this was a lovely horse and he was performing reasonably well, but he's got a lot of symptoms uh, or a lot of things common to many horses. And one of them is that he's got soreness in this region here from him dropping the back and pushing together the vertebrae and causing kissing spines. In this area here, he's actually bigger and more roach than he should be. He's fuller in the muscle there, and this is part of inflammation of these joints in the lumbar region from the spine being pushed up and strained and, uh, and restricted in its mobility in that area, creating trouble. In the front end, we've got the head and neck high as well, and that's associated with further problems in the lower neck, but we can't talk too much today. The Kissing spines, as I say, are coming together in this spot here. 
What are the causes of poor posture? There are many and varied causes and can be a very fit horse but, but end up with poor posture because of back pain in particular. So poorly conditioned backs would be the number one cause of poor posture where the horses are not getting adequate exercise to really deal with um, keeping good physical strength and good core strength. If they've got a big fat belly, that will drag on their back as well. And it could be a pregnant mare that suffers the same sort of weight problem through the belly. Uh, and it's not certainly not something that, that uh, is bad in that case but it's pulling on the back and pushing those vertebrae together. So back so or back soreness is a major component of the development of kissing spine. Horses brace, drop and brace their back to protect their back uh, from various forms of soreness and that just winds up kissing spine, sadly. Uh, we know that sore mouths and, and jaws and teeth and bitting problems will cause horses to lift their head and drop their back. If they've got uncomfortable tack of around their head, but also particularly saddles, then that will cause them to drop their back as well and cause poor posture. If a horse has got sore feet, again, it will brace itself and that will create problems with posture and um, lead to, to situations like this. Horses that are, are fearful or got anxiety, perhaps they can't cope with their, their mate leaving them behind um, or anxious because of soreness issues, they will have an exaggerated bad posture too. If the rider sadly hasn't got good enough riding ability, that's going to be hard on a horse's back uh, or they've got poor riding technique where they actually put the horse into a bad frame, which sadly happens too often with false collection uh, in amongst our horses, that can, can lead to or contribute to kissing spines as well. And sadly, there are some riders that are too heavy for their horse and the horse's back strength, and that creates issues uh, that, that uh, leads to kissing spines too. So just touch on a couple of these things. Poorly conditioned backs are really a major part of the problem. Horses don't get enough exercise, and, and I'm not the only one to see, say that. We, we need to keep up their exercise, uh, and if we can't ride enough, then, then for most horses, lunging over poles on a big circle really helps a horse maintain its core strength. But that's... that's that, got to be done with their back comfortable and there's lots of other issues. If a horse is spelled it actually comes weaker and weaker and so if you've got a kissing spine horse and, you, and it's in pain and you just put it out for a spell the pain will dissipate sure but their posture will be bad and, and festering away uh, while they're out spelling is this kissing spine problem that's actually going to be getting worse rather than getting better. There's an issue with feed restriction in horses too because if you've got a big belly on a horse that's pulling them, you think that's pulling them back down or, or it's just the horse is getting a big belly and it's, you know, in, it's not big everywhere else, it's not overly fat and it's just got a big belly. If you keep restricting its diet to get rid of the belly, often that backfires because horses go into what seems to be a drought mode and actually lay fat in around their intestines and that adds to the size of the belly at the same time as they steal protein from their back and their back gets weaker. So it's not simply a matter of just reducing the feed. It needs to be done in a very balanced way. So make sure you use adequate protein when you're changing the diet and you consult an equine nutritionist to help get things right. So one of the causes of back pain that's very common in horses is that of birth trauma. Now, I've talked about this for many years. It's really, really common, and we'll talk about that in the next couple of slides because it's something that needs mentioning. There are other, plenty of other causes of back pain for that matter too, um, 
that, that shouldn't be forgotten. And these can make birth trauma worse or they can be just the, the cause on, it, on their own. So pl horses have plenty of falls. They, their hooves get in trouble at times. Saddle fitting problems are common. Unresolved spinal dysfunction resulting from birth trauma, though, is a major thing that, that is in the background quite often with horses that upsets the posture. So birth trauma is common to all horses. There's none that escape it unless they have a caesarean, which is probably one in a million horses. It's pretty rare. It's not like humans. Uh, so they've got to squash their or got to force their way out through the birth canal. And they get highly squashed when they do that. And the most common place they get or most impacted area is that of the upper chest involving the spine under the shoulder blades and that reflects in trouble later in life. Also we, we get compression of the pelvis which is the next biggest part of the horse and that tends to be torsed and leads to, to problems uh, of weakness in that area that, that can come back to bite us as well. So birth trauma is highly associated with ten tightness and tenderness through the wither the girth and the chest, all areas that as riders we impact on. We put pressure on the wither and through the back, down through the girth. All these things are affected by birth trauma too. So, so we get an overlap of, of problems. This unresolved dysfunction tends to remain with horses all through their lives and it can be really mild to a point where it's not hardly affecting the horse or not affecting it at all, right through to super severe where a horse can't even cope with a saddle being uh, girthed up on it without throwing itself on the ground. It's also ups and downs with that amount of pain. Just like anyone with, with back pain, they've got good days and bad days and horses are very much the same. And this these residual effects of birth trauma can be rehabilitated uh, to a degree in most horses to where they're not bothering them anywhere near so much. Birth trauma not only affects those areas of the body but causes heightened anxiety and fear, leads to stomach ulcers very often. It, as I said, it has pain associated with the wither, the girth, the saddle seat, so all affecting us the pressure from us riding on them. Uh, it involves quite often bracing of the back and stiffening of the back and dropping of the back with high head carriage uh, and disengagement of the hind end. So it's a very important thing that needs to be addressed as far as treating kissing spines as well. Uh, if you want to find more information about birth trauma, which is a couple of hours on its own, then we um, the best thing for you to do is to go to my website and look at the articles on girth pain and birth trauma there. Certainly, as I said, there's other causes of back pain. Horses fall lots and lots uh, during their life. That causes trauma. Horses are heavy animals. They land heavily. They bruise just the same as us. And if you do a post-mortem on a horse that's, that's just had a major fall, the amount of bruising is just something astonishing. Uh, so that has an effect in itself. And there are strain and other problems that occur as a result of falls. We can't forget leg injuries too. We've mentioned hoof pain, but there are other leg injuries that can alter the posture and, and lead to poor posture and bracing in the back and contribute to kissing spines. One of the preventable causes of back trauma is that of horses getting cast. If everyone put casting rails in their stalls, these are rails, vertical rails about 1.5 to 2 metres apart, that would help horses to push themselves away from the wall and get themselves up without having to overexert. Uh, and I don't know why it's not done. Other causes include overexertion which can be jumping over a very high jump, bursting out of a barrier as a two-year-old, carrying a jockey at, 
from zero to a speed very quickly will create problems. Uh, and even just in a more domestic sort of situations, uh, rushing up steep s slopes will, will put a lot of strain on the back. What happens with the posture? There are numerous things that happen to the body and we'll run through just a few of those. As I've mentioned, the, the, when the chest drops, these vertebrae are pushed together, the ligaments are strained, vertebrae come apart at the bottom here and strain the ligaments between the vertebrae. The chest is dropped as that, that's, that's done too. The muscles on the, the neck pull up the neck and make the neck tighter here and, and contribute to arthritis of the lower neck and instability of the lower neck, which is all the worse if you've got a, a problem with congenital changes here. The manoeuvring or, or the front of the chest may move forward uh, and this can lock the sternum and the chest and compromise respiration. So horses can end up with asthma sort of problems. That would be much less of an issue if we improve the function of their chest. In the lumbar area, because things go down here, something's got to go up to balance the spine. So the lumbar vertebrae go up and that's what you see with that raised loin and the raised loin in so many horses. Uh, it's getting a bit roachy here. People say some think they're getting stronger through the loin and that's why they're building up muscles. This is an abnormal change. It should be, e muscles should be even right through the back and not just built up in this region. That going up there has to be a compensation so the pelvis doesn't have to alter so much to the chest dropping. But even still, it doesn't quite catch up. And what tends to be that tends to happen is the legs land behind the, the vertical and that creates abnormal strain on the legs, which can include the hock being destabilized and becoming arthritic, puts more stress on the suspensory ligament of the hind, hind legs. So we get a whole lot of problems that occur from poor posture. Um, just to mention some of them. How do we deal with kissing spines? The traditional veterinary treatment involves, say, rest for a protected period. As, as I mentioned, if rest is, is for a long period, then horses will drop their backs and that will contribute to kissing spines because their backs are poorly conditioned. So is it the right thing to do? Really questionable. The other alternative that's probably a bit more commonly recommended by my veterinary colleagues is to give them a cortisone, give them cortisone injections around where they're painful and then rest for a protected period. This is certainly going to give some temporary relief for the horse, but it may risk both infections and more, more commonly laminitis in horses, it may turn on laminitis and that could be a really bad thing, obviously. It can weaken uh, any associated ligament damage to put cortisone in that area too, because it actually stops healing uh, and, and leads to things breaking apart rather than getting stronger. So, so is it always a good idea? I'm really questionable. It's certainly not a good long-term answer to the problem particularly because we're actually just dealing with a symptom of what's going on in the body, the kissing spines, not dealing with why they're there. The other thing that is really popular at the moment, sadly, uh, is that of, amongst my colleagues, and that is that of surgery for kissing spines. And surgery for kissing spines is pretty gross in a lot of ways. It involves one of the surgeries involves removing every second vertebrae, the tip of, that is. So it can remove this one and this one. So there's no interference of the vertebrae anymore. And that surgery also involves uh, the cutting of nerves when, when those things are removed. So the nerves are, that are associated with the transmission of pain are removed and the tips are removed. The other surgery that is perhaps even more popular, is to cut down in between the vertebrae. And this affects the stability of the vertebrae 
but it cuts the nerves and therefore cuts off the pain signals uh, from that area. So it, it is a, a means of just getting rid of the signs of the problem without dealing with why it's there and may destabilize the spine, may lead to considerable complications uh, in a small number of cases. This surgery is usually in not only invasive, but quite costly. Because it's costly, usually there's extra tests taken to actually confirm that there's how much of a problem and how much needs to be taken out and all this sort of thing um, that us horse owners have to pay for if we're taking that route. Afterwards, it requires a fair bit of rest and rehabilitation. So it's not a quick fix and it uh, changes the horse forever and, as I said, can cause complications. It's something that's very questionable. I think in a very, very rare number of cases, it's probably the right way to go. But that is what I've just said, very, very rare case. Uh, but going back to what I said earlier, sadly, this is a fashionable thing to do uh, in amongst the veterinary profession not just in Australia, but around the world. And it's something that, that uh, is a sad thing for the horse when, again, we're talking about a symptomatic treatment. There are many ways to alleviate kissing spines when we think about, you know, if posture particularly is behind it and pain of the back is behind it uh, and the way the horse uses itself is behind it, then we need to deal with a lot of those things first. And that's something that can be done without actually touching the area where the, the horse's spines are kissing. These days I sort of cover that area, but I also do some direct treatments as well. And a number of my colleagues are adopting that, that approach as uh, progressively more and more are adopting that approach over time too. So the, Direct treatment I use is a regenerative injection therapy. It's commonly known as dextrose prolotherapy. And it's a therapy we've stolen from human sports medicine practice. Uh, it's been done in humans since the 1950s or before. And it, like in this photo from one of the, the main texts on prolotherapy, the material, the injection is, is injected either directly either just either side of the, the interspinous ligaments or, or, or a little bit more to the edge of, of the ligaments themselves. And this actually helps to cause the, the repair of the strained tissue. It causes the release of growth factors. It reduces nerve inflammation and it turns off pain. So it's, it's a very good therapy for a painful area and an in not only reducing the pain, but encouraging healing. So the, the irritated bone surface is treated, the area between the vertebrae, the interspinous ligaments, and the junction between the supraspinous and interspinous ligaments are all treated. And this treatment is actually quite safe, quite straightforward, and clinically very effective. So I would love more veterinarians to adopt this method of treating them rather than going for surgery and, and other um, things like cortisone for the problem. Part of the, there's many facets to indirect treatments. Uh, it's about getting pain under control. In my practice, veterinary chiropractic and veterinary osteopathic techniques coupled with veterinary acupuncture are the indirect treatments, if you like, and then getting horses doing the right sort of exercises, dealing with saddle pain and getting them in more suitable saddles. And the exercises, of course, have got to help the horse develop its core strength. We use nutritionists to help, help the owners get the nutrition more balanced so they can build muscle better. And everything has got to work in that sort of whole horse approach to, to get things going right. Saddle fit is something that's so important, I need to just touch on that a little bit too. 
Saddle fit is not just a matter of traditionally fitting a saddle so it matches a horse's back. It's got to take into account the more sensitive parts of a horse's back. It's got to make sure that the saddle is distributing the, the weight of the rider really well and distributing them, as I was saying, into the right, right sort of places. Sadly, for horses and horse owners, a lot of saddle fashion at the moment is concentrated on things that don't actually help back pain, that are actually um, supposedly freeing the shoulder or bringing the rider closer to the horse. And a lot of these things actually increase the amount of soreness horses have in their back. It may not be apparent early when a new saddle is adopted, but after three months it's often coming into play and really causing havoc. Uh, but often the saddle's not blamed because it's an expensive, perfect saddle and it's been shown to fit. But fitting's not all the issue. It's got to be suitable for the horse's problems, and especially if it's got pre-existing pain. So there's many pieces to the puzzle of dealing with kissing spines. Nutrition, teeth, feet, back soreness, saddle issues, building the core strength. The rider has got to do the right thing by the horse and the rider sadly is, can't be too heavy for the horse. So I'd like to really thank everybody for giving the time to have a look at this presentation. It's only a short abridged one, but hopefully it will give you a better insight than you had and get rid of some of the misunderstandings that you've had. There are three things I'd like you to go home with particularly. And one is that kissing spines are a symptom of not just one problem, but a much bigger problem. And we need a whole horse approach to dealing with it that surgery is a very much a symptomatic treatment and is even if you use rehab with it, is still only dealing, turning off a symptom and is unnecessary in all but except very rare cases. And the other thing is, please don't go on the internet and end up down those rabbit burrows of misinformation which are really in abundance about kissing spines. Please avoid doing that. Um, there is um, an article on my website, which is an older one, um, that will give you some indication of, of what to follow, but this, this presentation is, is much more up to date than that. If you need further help on, on back pain issues, then these are sites that uh, can help you particularly the Australian Veterinary Acupuncture Group and ABPA. Um, for mainstream approaches to kissing spines and back pain, uh, you can go to my uh, colleagues, Equine Veterinary Association, uh, which I am a member of, but sadly I don't go along with the common approach to kissing spines. My website, of course, is here and Overall, thank you again for taking the time to consider this issue and, and attend the talk. Bye for now.